Hello everybody and many thanks for joining us for this panel this afternoon. My name is Katie Milligan and before I begin my paper I would like to just say a special word of thanks to Simon and everyone at the Irish Architectural Archive for inviting me to be part of this celebration of Malta today and most especially for agreeing to allow me to pre-record my paper due to an unavoidable uh, scheduling clash. I hope I won't repeat too much of what has been said by the other contributors today, but perhaps given our singular topic, some overlap is inevitable. This paper is an expanded version of a short text that will shortly appear in a new volume on Malton published by the Little Museum of Dublin. That in turn began its life as a tweet about Malton's view of South William Street when I was preparing an online course for the National Gallery of Ireland earlier this year. Surprisingly, perhaps, given my interest in and previous research on artist representations of Dublin, this was one of the first times I had seriously sat and considered Malton's representation of the city. Of course, I had seen them. I'm sure I'm not the only person here today who was introduced to Malton through sets of placemats and prints in doctors' waiting rooms, but I had never really been uh, encouraged to research them further. A change came, however, when I stumbled across Yvonne Boland's poem titled On Seeing James Malton's Paris Court House, Dublin 1795, published in The Stinging Fly in 2007. In the spirit of reflection, which this day is uh, encouraging us to do, and if you will indulge me, I would like to now uh, read Boland's poem to um, kind of frame um, the rest of my paper. Closed as I was, day after day, into that city with its iron ocean air composed of a single perfect shade of grey. I never believed there were others, their eyes half shut, a harsh determined line to their mouth, their hats with falling brims in the direct light of the far south, writing down names and names. The secrets of the lily, the life of the amaryllis, a single eyelid scarred with a million years opening, closing opening on the one dying lizard. Naming the earth seemed to me then only a gateway to death. The beautiful city died, was made extinct. A city with huge wings, a city with rare habits. What good did it do to name it? I let the question rise and grow into rays of weak Irish sunlight. The start of another day on a paved Dublin street and praise the engraver's art, the gloomy studio, aqua tinta, mezzo tinto, Dry point, steel point, the wax where it lies on a copper surface, the burnisher beside it, the acid smelling rooms where nothing ever dies. In this poem, Boland evokes the studio of the artist and the printmaker, alongside the wor world and work of the naturalist and the explorer, tasked with creating taxonomies of the natural world, as well as evoking the rare and visual lights, delights that can illuminate an otherwise grey city street. Her words encourage us to think about those that walked these streets before us, as well as those who live in the city with us today. Her closing line is an apparent appeal to the sense of timelessness that the printed image can capture, that sense of Malton's Dublin being kept alive through the process of reproduction. As reflected in the many titles of the various papers today, the question of what Malton's views tell us about Dublin continues to preoccupy many of us. For my own part, Boland's description of Dublin as a city of rare habits is what I would like to use to focus on just one of the views from a picturesque and descriptive guide of Dublin and see how we can use this um, idea of a rare habit to illuminate the 18th century life of the city. So the, the chief interest of Malton's view of William Street is the large mansion at the centre of the composition, Paris Court House. Designed by Robert Mack, a, a Scottish stonecutter, the house was built between 1771 and 74, shortly before Malton came to depict it, and has been described by Christine Casey as, quote, a last gasp Palladianism on a grand scale in a narrow street with a superb but schizophrenic interior, unquote. In the text that originally accompanied this print, Malton also, Malton also drew attention to the perhaps incongruous situation of this grand house, noting that it was, and I quote, 
unhappy in point of situation, being shut up in a confined but genteel private street, and its important, importance much lessened by mean dwellings directly opposite, through which is an entrance to a market, Castle Market, lately removed there." Unquote. However, he did also draw attention to the interior, being finished and furnished with much, with much elegance and taste, particularly the ball and drawing rooms. Paris Court's time as a private home was limited. After its completion, the Wingfield family lived there for less than 40 years, selling the property to the government in 1807, when it was subsequently remodelled by Francis Johnson for use as a stamp office. Looking elsewhere in the print, we can see street signs for Coppinger's Row and William Street, um, and the elegant rustication and a bow window of the city assembly rooms. The second of William Street's prominent 18th century buildings, the rooms have been purpose-built as an academy and exhibition space by the short-lived Society of Artists. However, as Malton informed his readers, it was, by the time of publication, quote, seldom used but for picture auctions and other sales, and has also made an occasional meeting room for large assemblies and is used for concerts, dances and shows, unquote. In 1791, Dublin Corporation began to hold its assemblies in the building, eventually acquiring it in 1809. The overall impression given by Moulton's view of the street of one is, is one of pro prosperity, with handsome brick and stone buildings pleasantly occupied by a range of city characters, from fine ladies to more ragged loiterers. It is in these margins, however, that I'm suggesting that we can learn um, more about the 18th century consumer life of Dublin. On the right hand side of the image, we see two men uh, converse outside the assembly house. The figure on the steps appears to be emerging from the building, pulling on his gloves as he does so, while his companion rests easily on horseback. The latter man's outstretched hand draws the viewer's attention to the window behind him. Something has also caught the eye of one of the silk clad ladies walking on the street. Here in a detail that might be overlooked, we enter the commercial world of the 18th century city. Adorning the, adorning the center of the fruit warehouse window display is a large pineapple surrounded by smaller, undistinguishable fruits and flowers. If Moulton considered this to be a confined but genteel street, this detail also suggests that it was a fashionable one, sustained by a market for luxury goods brought into the city to supply the best tables. So before I come back to consider this detail of the pineapple, I want to think about Malton's Dublin project more broadly and how it in itself contributed to this world of luxury consumption. <clears throat> when published, a picturesque and descriptive guide to the city of Dublin contributed to a then burgeoning market for large format illustrated travel books made for well-to-do patrons, subscribers and purchasers. Advances in print technology in the latter half of the 18th century facilitated this growth, not least to the pop through the popularisation of Aquatint. Previous publications on the history of Dublin, such as, such as Robert Poole and James Cash's views of the most remarkable buildings, monuments and other monuments and other edifices in the city of Dublin, published in 1780, or other near contemporary texts like John Ferrar's A View of Ancient and Modern Dublin, published in 1807, relied on less sophisticated engravings of the city's architecture, clearly lacking the artistic sensibility sought and promoted by Malton. In Britain, an acquaintance of the Maltons family was a key pioneer, pioneer of the new medium of aquatint. Paul Sandby, whose dates are 1731 to 1809, had trained as a military draftsman and landscape painter, traveling with the army, with the British army, to various locations, including Dublin. During the 1770, Sand, Sandby began to experiment with aquatint, a new method that enabled the artist to capture the tonal and wash effects of watercolour in print, creating a more painterly and textured effect than engraving alone. Sandby found that the process was particularly adept for capturing landscape scenes, and some of his early, earliest experiments in the medium showed the Welsh countryside and coast, such as the view here you see of um, Chepstow Castle. Like an etching, aquatint is an intaglio print method using a copper plate immersed in acid. 
Granules of acid res resist laid on the plate create a fine pattern when the plate is, plate is inked, and, inked and printed from, cr which creates its wash-like effect. And you see here an early uh, 19th century guide to how these different grounds and resists uh, can be used to, to create the effect. An aqua tint could be further enhanced through the application of thin washes of watercolour or hand through hand colouring, completed either by the artist, printer, or by a third party. And this is something that we see in relation to Molson. So just to, to give you a sense of it here, um, using the example of South William Street, we can see through extant, extant examples how the scene differs in different stages or with different uses of hand colouring. For example, here we have just a monochrome aqua tint. Uh, this is from a bound copy in UCD Special Collections. This is the hand coloured uh, version from the Irish Architectural Archives own collection, which you can see in the exhibition at the moment. And one of my favourite sets of the Malton um, prints, this is from the Art Institute of Chicago, um, which is a very brightly um, coloured um, series of them. So as Douglas Fordham has outlined, from its inception, the aquatin process was aligned to topographical draftsmanship and its military uses, the production of folios and books, and the rather nebulous aesthetic category of the picturesque. Commented on extensively by 18th century aesthetes, most notably William Gilpin, the picturesque encompasses a subject, usually a landscape, how it is presented and the effect it has on the viewer. The focus for the picturesque is at once on scopic pleasure, the visual framing of the subject and its legibility, as well as the elision or reduction of difficult social realities. When combined, the processes of aquatint, theories of the picturesque, and the book trade created as Fordham, what Fordham calls a set of material practices that establish new modes of seeing and representing the world. Through an illustrated publication, where aquatint images were joined by a letterpress description, readers could experience the world without leaving the comfort of their own homes. This visual and commercial history is important for understanding the audience that Malton sought to reach with his Dub Dublin views. Furthermore, it was an audience that his brother, Thomas Malton Jr., was also trying to um, appeal to with his own series of aquatint prints um, showing the city of London and Westminster, began in 1792 and completed in 1801, so really directly contemporary with what James is doing in Dublin. Showing the architecture uh, and streets um, of, Lond of London and Westminster, Thomas's series was undoubtedly more ambitious than his younger brother's Dublin series. It ultimately totaled 100 plates and was sold in two volumes as a, at a cost of £14 and 4 shillings each. There is an extant list of subscribers, and Thomas's venture was supported by a cross-section of artistic and society patrons. Although there is no corresponding list for James Malton's Dublin volume, he would surely have sought to capitalise on the social world um, through different connections um, and through flattery. Indeed, this is evident throughout the dedications to notable figures in his letterpress descriptions of the Dublin scenes. Conceived of and published in the decade prior to the Act of Union and still being actively advertised in its aftermath, many of those which Malton sought to pay court were navigating a new relationship to the Irish city. However, patronage from these elite circles was necessary, complementing the world of commerce and consumption portrayed in its pages, a picturesque and descriptive view was itself a luxury product. As a bound folio of 25 prints, the prices for a copy range from six pounds and sixteen shillings and sixpence um, in boards, seven pounds seven shillings and sixpence elegantly bound, and eight pounds eight shillings for an edition elegantly bound with a portfolio or extra cover, and this equates to close to a thousand pounds today, give or take, depending uh, where you, you know, uh, want to, which copy you wanted to purchase. So this was a luxurious volume. This is reflected not only in its cost, but in its size and um, being produced in imperial size, meaning that it would need to be placed in a flat surface, in a, in a cradle, um, 
to be looked at by the purchaser. Sold through fashionable stationers and print sellers in London and in Dublin, such as um, this is a trade card here for William Allen, who was one of the stockists of Malton's book in Dublin. The artist may have imagined his volume on an elegant table in a morning room or library, prominently displayed for the enjoyment of visitors. These material elements of Malton, Malton's original series can be easily lost in the subsequent reprintings and reformattings of his compositions through the 18th, 19th and 20th centuries. And so I think it's important that we can kind of remember that this was seen as, as a folio volume, as a, as a complete set to be perused um, and enjoyed, rather perhaps than as we see it today, as a series of prints framed and mounted on an exhibition wall. So keeping these different ideas in mind, such as the picturesque, this idea of creating a, an ideal image, and this set of um, kind of trade practices around luxury uh, publications. I want to now, uh, for the second half of my uh, paper, return to the pineapple seen in the window of um, the William Street Fruit Warehouse. So perhaps looking again at this depiction of Paris Court House and William Street, we can perhaps see more clearly the bringing together of ideas around the picturesque through the architectural and social detail, um, including this window display and the artfully placed city type. So just maybe if we have a closer look for a minute, we have, of course, here the um, kind of street trader and a, a slightly kind of less well-dressed figure. We have our fine ladies here, our figures on horseback, and then this is the window uh, that I'm talking about here. And I hope you can just see uh, the little pineapple um, in the window. <clears throat> By the time Malton came to his subject, the pineapple was, quote, a highly desired colonial commodity, unquote, not only making its appearance in shop windows, but on dining tables and in a host of material goods. The history of the fruit in Europe is tightly bound with histories of exploration and colonialism. In the 15th century, Christopher Columbus encountered the pineapple on the islands of Guadeloupe, Hispaniola and Jamaica and returned specimens to Spain. In the following century, Portuguese explorers brought pineapples to their colonies in South America, the Azores, East and West Africa, India, China and other locations in Southeast Asia. The Dutch East Indies received specimens from the West Indies and so it spread throughout these locations. The Spanish term piña, or little pine, is the root of the English word for the fruit first used in the 17th century. Like other tropical fruits and commodities such as sugar and coffee, the Caribbean, and Jamaica in particular, was a primary source of pineapples for Britain and Ireland, relying on the labour of enslaved people for their cultivation. As the transportation time from the Caribbean to Britain and Ireland was lengthy, horticulturalists and their wealthy patrons soon looked to find the means to cultivate these tropical fruits closer to home. Dutch gardeners pioneered the hothouse system, producing fruiting pineapples, and the methods were brought to Britain through diplomatic and royal channels. These proliferated throughout the 18th century, and the fruit became invis increasingly visible in consumer life. So we can look at a range of examples here. For example, Liz Bellamy, a literary uh, scholar, has written about the changing symbolism of the pineapple through the 18th and early 19th century, noting how in the 1770s it would, was used to, quote, connote corruption and extravagance, unquote. But by the 1790s, when Malton is including it in one of his scenes, the pineapple had a deep connection to the British colonies and enslavement. We see this, for example, in Jane Austen's Mansfield Park. It, the successful, successful cultivation of pineapples in England is used to underline the source of the family's wealth. And as Bellamy argues, the pinery is, quote, maintained in unnatural conditions to accommodate the tastes of an elite, just as the slaves are forced to work in unnatural and inhuman conditions to produce the luxury of sugar, unquote. 
Perhaps the best known example of the pineapple in influencing architectural design is the Dunmore Pineapple, a folly in Stirlingshire in Scotland, designed for the fourth, fourth Earl of Dunmore, who cultivated pineapples in his hothouses. Although a more common use of the um, pineapple as I suppose a decorative device was in iron or stonework. Aficionados could incorporate the fruit into their clothing, as you see here in two examples, a, a French silk morning robe um, now in the Boston Museum of Fine Arts, or even in this uh, men's um, waistcoat here. And you can see how this we have a stylized pineapple used in the border decoration there. We can also see how it was incorporated into ceramic and decorative arts with these um, examples of teapots and other tableware from the V&A and even in satirical prints we have an example here of Matthew Darley by Matthew Darley showing the fruit stall with this woman and her huge um, wig and a pineapple sitting proudly on it or in this German satirical print where again we see the pineapple being used as a centerpiece. Now I'm going to stay on go back a um, Ireland was not immune to the pineapple craze and on tables across the country, um, as well as in gardens, the pineapple was displayed and cultivated. The important chronicler of 18th century Irish life, Mary Delaney, recalled that in 1758 she had 10 pineapples, quote, sent me from Dublin as fine ones as ever I tasted by Lord Charlemagne's orders, unquote. The following year, in 1759, she wrote to her sister that while visiting, quote, Mrs. Clement's Lodge in the Phoenix Park, a pineapple was brought ready paired and cut, all served in fine old china." Unquote. Throughout the 18th century, Dublin newspapers advertised pineapple plants for sale. For example, in September 1789, Edward Bray, a nursery and seedman based at 16 Merchants Quay, advertised that he had, quote, several thousands of fruiting and succession pineapple plants, unquote, noting specifically that they were of Antigua pineapples, along with other soft fruits such as peaches, nectarines, plums and cherries. Another nursery, Swans, described their location as, quote, the sign of the pineapple at the corner of the circular road, Kevinsport, unquote, while several groceries advertised their stock of pineapple rum. In 1787, Joseph Bershoyle of Cork Street offered a reward for items stolen from his home, including a coffee pot with a pineapple at the top. The classified ads also show the presence of a pinery offered as a selling point for properties. The experience of tending to them was both offered and appealed for in gardening job advertisements. Comparison with these type of contemporary records shows how Malton's views of Dublin timed with its material reality, even if only for its wealthier inhabitants. As Duna Cahill and David Fleming have noted, Malton altered elements of William Street for this print. The steps of the assembly house have been extended across its facade, the basement and its attendant railings have been omitted, and the artist has significantly reduced the width of the opening to Carpenter's Row. The elegantly bowed shop window is also an amendment to what's seen there today. These alterations provide tangible evidence of how Malton moulded his view of Dublin to create a picturesque streetscape. Allied to this, we can also consider how through details like tropical fruit, silk clothing and fine carriages, he created a consumer landscape that aligned to what his patrons wanted to see, rather than a simple translation from street to sketchbook to copper plate and to print. Newspaper records suggest that for a short time in the 1790s, the perfumer and fruit merchant James Middlewood had a premises at 57 William Street, the next building along to the City Assembly House, in addition to a larger wholesale and retail warehouse at 46 Fishamble Street. Could Malton have been inspired by this neighbouring shop when he set about his composition? Or perhaps, being aware of the current fashion for the commodity, Malton may also have imagined the visual and material desires of the patron who would purchase his publication and consciously courted this type um, courted this with the type of city he sought to present. When viewed in the book and print seller shops of Dame Street, Pall Mall, Bond Street or Holborn, 
Malton's Prince of Dublin were tasked with not only disseminating the history and notable architectural features of Dublin, but with impressing upon the reader or viewer its desirability as a fashionable centre of commerce and sociability. For those unfamiliar with the city, Malton's views offered a glimpse into a place outside of the everyday, chiming with the growing taste for imagery of new and interesting places within the parameters of the picturesque view. The importance of a picturesque and descriptive view of the city of Dublin to Dublin's to the city's 18th century history transcends its value as a chronicle of its architectural features. Through its subjects, both real and imagined, and its material form, it highlights how the city was connected to a world of commerce, trade and artistic innovation, while also showing how these could be choreographed into an idea or even an ideal of a city and society.